So it's our thesis here, right? It wiggles through time, and it gets to the point here, right? I start with the thesis here, again, rerun evolution, wiggles, comes here. The thesis here, comes here, wiggles here, right? If I could sum up across all of those, if I could look across all of those, what distribution would I get? Well, I get a normal. So they had a star phylogeny, the only thing that you should instinctually hate at this point, right, because it shows lack of information, right? I had that happening, all starting from the same point, the terminals should be normally distributed. No. Right, so shift, so um, basically they all start from the same point. They evolve independently, right? They're never going to do a, a density plot or a histogram of species sizes right now. I expect that to be normally the case. In the same way, there are many factors that lead to our heights in this room. Sorry, what's the so not, not within species, just, I mean, this is species too, but, but across species with species means, I would expect them to be normally distributed. Right? The same way our heights are normally distributed in this room, relative. Right? So we each have various factors leading to our height, which is x plus. Still not there. Uh, ask questions. Right, and so there's two things here. One is um, sort of how many wiggles do you have to get to get normal across a single one, right? So that was the same way with our simulation of the central limit theorem. You do one toss, and it's exponential, you get an exponential distribution. It requires doing, adding up a bunch, right? But how many is a bunch? It's not clear how the normal distribution is. Like if you're going for normal, you need one. If you're going exponential, you need more than one. Right, so approach, it refers to that as something. Um, <coughs> Generally, assume with evolution that's happening fast enough for generation that we get that. Yeah. With some exceptions, we're going to get to. Now, across species, to get that, um, there's not something to really think about much because the tree isn't like this. It's like that. Let me get some other markers. So this, this was just for one species, right? Mm -hmm. Just for us. And so we would have, like that one, he wants, he wants us to know that's a normal distribution when he looks across species, not just at once, right? Yeah, it's just adding up more than once. Right, All right, good. So I hear people talking. Good. Thank you. <laughs> what? <laughs> I just, uh, it just seemed like two different examples of looking across species and looking within species, but if there's some sort of selection. I guess over time. So you do it within Such species, too. So I start off here, right? I say, OK, so I have this possible range of trait values. I start off here. What's the probability of it being here versus here? Right? And I can figure that out. Um, and basically, that probability is a normal. Right, so the expectation is, um, if the sums are on average zero, and we can get to this later, it would be centered at the original point, right? And depending on how fast it's wiggling, it might be this distribution or it might be that distribution, right? Or that distribution. Okay? If the wiggling is biased and tending to get bigger through time, then it will be this distribution or that distribution. So you can't get a shift in the normal distribution type, but you can get that shift in the, when you sum them all together, the distribution. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
So, you know, if I throw a bunch of dandelion seeds up in the air, they can come back down, right? How would it be distributed? Normally, right? If I throw a bunch of dandelion seeds up in the air, and the wind's blowing. How they come down? Normally, but with a shift. Yeah. We're getting this? Okay. So this is really cool, because now I can say, for a given species, yeah, what's the probability is going to be this versus this. Okay. And if I have an observation of two species, okay, I know they started here, and now one's here and one's here. Right? What distribution makes that most likely? Right? So the probability distribution is this, right? They're, these are very unlikely values. Right? Where the probability distribution is like this, these are more likely, right? So I can estimate from the distribution of species my evolutionary rate and my ancestral state, okay? Just by assuming the central limit theorem. So it would have to include all ancestors. So if I had more, if I had all the instances that I had a lot more data, right? So if I if I knew, so if you just if you just look at the tips, it'd be you'd have two. Right, but if I'm assuming, assuming a common distribution for both, right? Exactly whether whether this one goes right or left is dependent on like random factors. And it's like you know I pull my from a uniform distribution is it a positive or negative? Okay, it affects whether I go right or left for that one. But if they're being affected by the same distribution. And they have the same life field surface at the end. Okay. What we actually do is take that code you have with your given function, whatever it is. So unif, r exponential, and let's just simulate stuff wiggling through time. Okay, so you can just see how this works. All right, so you can so just write down this or write down the analogous code. Right, and think about what we're doing here. So we're taking time steps. Right? We're starting the taxon at state 0. Okay? And we're making a vector to store our states at each step. Right? So start at the start state, and you have the NAs. And all we do is each step, we say, okay, where do I go next? My next time step was where I was, plus a little wiggle, wiggle factor for my distribution. Which could be from exponential, it could be from normal, whatever I have, uniform, whatever I've broken in here. I just do a little wiggle. And all I'm going to do then is just keep track of all those wiggles and then plot where I go. There are more efficient ways to do it than this, but this is the way it's sort of easiest to understand.
Yeah. 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 This is one way of getting success. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Now, yeah. if your rules don't go up, that's okay. So yours has a bias when you're shooting with a uniform, right? Right. So uniform, you're doing it between zero and one. So now we just go up that one. But I actually always do that. But nothing happened. But that is uncommon. Our studio would be uh, you got you It's our studio for you too. Yeah. yeah. And you, you just have to download it separately. Yeah. Oh, great. And it's nice because you get no views from this anywhere. It's a straight line. <laughs> no. All right, so what are we doing here? <laughs> We're simulating the discrete time evolutionary process, right, where every time step, your little critter is moving based on this random function you gave it. Okay? And so <coughs> you could, you know, if you want, you can run it again, and then rather than doing plot, you can do lines. And you can overplot on the line showing another simulation. Right, so where it says plot here, just replace this, run this again, and replace this with lines instead, and it will draw another line on top of your plot. Like to shoot over, like I was really excited when I figured out that R had a detect editor built in because like R is an automatic. So that was like excitement. And then, oh. and then figuring out that I could highlight a new set five and shoot over. Yeah, so somewhere you, um, that's what you were doing. Yeah, like way back when, I'm like, then you should have got it. Yeah, so I figured out some other stuff. Oh, I had a word document. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, All right. So, what are you going to do? I did a similar thing. Different language. Um, <laughs> so, you see stuff like this, right? Yeah. Okay. And so, 
whatever your function was, well it's not like things are like Cauchy, this distribution of size at the end at time 100 should be normal. So if you run the pseudo product histogram of that, it would be normally distributed. <coughs> okay, so that's if we're summing things. Are evolution factors summed? How else could we be combining evolutionary factors? No subtraction, same thing, right? Multiply them, right? So rather than increasing by, so think about body size, right? I have an elephant and I have a mouse. Are they going to both decrease in size by a kilogram with equal probability? No, a mouse can't. But could they increase, decrease in size by 10%? Sure, right? Which is a percentage of, of which is multiplication, right? So central limit theorem is for addition, right? How can I convert multiplication to addition? Biological, biological traits, we actually log transform them if we're doing this. Right? And the reason is because then it fits the next piece, uh, fits the central limit theorem. Right? And you think about it, it makes sense. <coughs> right? So we have traits that can like increase and decrease in size, my mass is going to be less than zero. Right? For the species. But if you log transform it, you, know, you can keep increasing by half, by half each time, you never get below zero. It also fits the central limit theorem better. So if we have biological data, you'll log transform it and then multiply these factors. Okay, and that's why. Questions? We're getting this so far? So we see how we get this nice little picture. Okay. Now what we want to be able to do is get the likelihood for my model. Right? So you need to be able to plug and chuck into an equation. Here's the equation. Okay. Here's a slightly friendlier equation. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. yeah. The true mathematicians like this and they're annoyed by this. Yeah. Where you are. Um, so this is what you get for standard normal distributions, a single, single character normal distribution, right? And so what's this? Mean? Yep. What's this? Variance. Variance. Yep. So I can give you, you know, number 10, and I can say, what's the likelihood of getting a 10 if my mean is 0 and my variance is Plug them in here, get a number. Three plug them in here, get a number. So what this is SD rather variance. Okay. <coughs> That's it. So now for a given branch on a tree, right? I can say I start here, I end here, my variance equals that. What's the likelihood of this? Right? And then you can say, okay, well what if this were Two, what's the likelihood? What if this were three? Right? And you know, this we observe, we just measure. Here we can estimate, and here we get this we can estimate. Okay, if you can see just from a normal distribution, these are estimating ancestral states. Now the problem with that <coughs> is that that's for a single branch. What about for this complex tree structure? Well, similar sort of thing, but it's just a multivariate normal. Okay. So we still have the same mean at the root. Okay. 
but now we have some correlation. So these two are going to be closer, closer to each other than they are with this one. So we have all this shared history. Right? And that comes into our, rather than a variance, we have a variance covariance matrix here. Okay. And this is, you know, seems scary, but it's actually very easy to calculate. Okay. <coughs> actually, when I had my, my oral exam, which is something you're going to have soon, I was asked, can you draw a variance covariance matrix? And I said, yes. And wait for the next question without like leading up to something. Because it's easy. But actually that was the question. So yeah. So here's how you do it. <coughs> so you just say, so for variance for A, it's just the length from A to the root times the rate. Okay? Same way we're thinking about here, from here to here with a rate, right? You get a variance. Okay? And the variance is some sort of Time independent variance times time. Okay? Does that make sense? So think of my wiggling going through, wiggle that part, and then wiggle that part, right? So if I have some variance here, some variance here, the total variance is the sum of them. That make sense? Okay. Take a normal distribution, and then sample that and get no and add another normal distribution to that, you get add the variance. So, doing that for continuous time, it's this rate times time. So for this, it's just, you know, going here, it's just the rate here times the time. Okay. Covariance is that, but how much is shared? So for A and B, it's just this is shared. Covariance. Okay, that's it. So I can make this matrix, and then for this mean, Vector means now, because I don't have a single tax on. Typically, it's just the root state. Okay. So now I can just plug and chug into this formula. Instead of having a single variance, I have this matrix. Instead of having a single mean, I have a, ve a vector of means. And then I can just get the length of it. Okay. And just like with our uh, discrete state thing the other day, where I can try tweaking this matrix, here I can try, try tweaking the matrix in various ways. Okay. So let's have a five minute break and then come back and figure out how I can tweak the matrix.
No, you don't. Exactly. We moved here and we're all excited. And that was the first winter we were here. We lived in Rockford. And the last winter we lived in Knoxville. And it didn't snow. We had a one Halloween last year in Massachusetts. It it snowed like that much. It was like a foot or something (laughs) in October. Yeah, I I grew up in Boston, so I can drive in snow and stuff. But like... I was here, I was supposed to give a talk to people in Sweden from like here, and I couldn't actually drive in because the roads were so bad, I ended up sliding backwards down the hill in front of our house. Because like, they just don't treat the roads here, just like, the, the treatment is yeah. like, wait for spring, it'll be fine. Yeah, <laughs> we have for our tires, that's never going to be used then. Like, I'm, oh, you'll use them. Already, like, if they would just salt the, the road, road it's just like, the like, like, salt, it'll like, make the, it makes the ice like, like holy enough so that yeah. like, when you drive, it breaks it up, but like. They actually had someone like, in, someone from like, the Department of Public Works, like, in a back of a pickup truck, with like, shoveling a few bits of salt <laughs> at some of the bad intersections. Oh, I, I was talking to some of my students. They're like, "Yeah, we don't have salters here. They're like, we don't do that here. We do not. So I was we like, live in snow days here. Questions for this part so far? Okay. People still seem a little shaky about it, which is fine. So, yeah, ask questions. I, mean, I understand where you're going. I probably couldn't reproduce much of that. Okay. But I. But when you highlight things, I'm like, okay, I see where those go. Yeah, I've been told in the past that people like people like oh, I'm listening to you. I can understand it perfectly. And they walk away and don't know. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Um, <coughs> all right, so the main point here. Stuff happens to a species, right? I'm referring a lot. And they can be from some distribution or another distribution. But, almost, but for almost all distributions, it ends up being normally distributed. Okay. With some mean in some variance. Okay. And so for single species, they can choose the normal typical mean. That marker is like not showing up. Some mean, some variance. Okay, so that's for single, single independent species. Okay, um, I could do that for multiple species if they're independent. Same thing. Okay. If they're dependent, if they're non-dependent, they have to take that into account. And the way you do that is by using a multivariate normal and a regular normal. Okay, and there, rather than these species having its own independent variance, um, so if it were this right here. My variance covariance matrix would all be T, here's T, and everything else is zeros. Right, no covariance. Okay. Here, I would have if this is T1, this is T2, and this is T3. In my overall, my rate of unit time is this. So we can do the variance covariance matrix. Anyone? Do it? So, yeah. A, B, C, 
C, A, B, C. What's A's variance? The letters and stuff. Yeah. Just whatever, whatever blood plot says. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So T1 plus T2 or T3. Same thing. Right? Okay. What about A with B? Yep. A with C. <coughs> Yes, that's going to do it. Other. Right? So, from here. So, they are covariants. So, they, they, they have the same mean as this vector. Okay. There's no covariance. Yeah. There's no covariance. Good. All right. B with A. B with B? Yep. T1 plus T2. Now, it could be that if I were doing something like fossil species, right, it could be that, you know, B is from the Cretaceous and B is right here and everything else is recent. That doesn't, they don't necessarily have to be equal, okay, but for co species, they often are. Good. Okay, B with C? Now, here's why I have here's why I have a job here. So pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> if this rate here is that, right, purple rather than blue, how does this change? How does the grand matrix change? Nope, because the AB covariance is still here, same as the blue rate. Uh -huh. Exactly, just the BB. What does BB become? So it's just stuff that accumulates here plus here. Right? So it's T2 plus purple one. T1. Right? Too small. Hmm? <laughs> You're writing too small. Oh, we're writing too small. Okay. <laughs> so it becomes. So the blue one is. Yeah. 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 Yeah
B is evolving in an area where the amount of change is undergoing is much greater. Right? So, you know, A is looking about the big lunar area of new islands evolving really quickly. So it's moving back and forth very quickly under you know, response to different selection pressures. Right? Well then this rate should be higher. Right? So now I can test it. I take this model, you know, with, with these being one rate, plug and chug get the likelihood. Then I have this model with different rates, plug and chug get the likelihood. Compare the models. Very basic. That hadn't been done until 2006. Okay, so like my first like big paper as a grad student was that. It's like, oh, like that was second rate. Ta da! Yeah. <laughs> Written program. You know, and so that's all it was, just you know, a second rate. <coughs> okay? And now some of you could say, oh, could we have a third rate? Sure. Right? Could we have could we paint, you know, could we have a rate that's You know, only this part of the tree has one rate, and the rest has a different rate. Sure, I've not done that yet, but you know, you can figure out exactly oh, how I plug it in here. Right? <coughs> and so all you're doing is just modifying this basic model, like the likelihood of comparing. Yeah. Well, why hadn't they done assessment to something like that, like something with variable rates of change, would make more sense in terms of like. Our environments actually work instead of something static like that. Mm -hmm. So then, like, or then rates aren't rates of evolution kind of like arbitrary then, since it like mostly depends on those models, like the static models, instead of incorporating like different rates over time. Um. So, so I mean, part of it is like a power issue, right? So yeah, I mean, so in theory, each of should have its own rate. They don't have power to pick that up, right? So the extreme, you know, simplification of that is one way everywhere, which gets you some ways. Okay. It was until McCurson had a question of, you know, <coughs> these fish are, you know, are, you know, it's like our sunfish bass example. Maybe it was a sunfish bass example. You know, sunfish do a lot of different things. This evolves faster than bass. We can trust minnows. We test this. Sort of pudgy tests, but nothing just says, oh, you have to have faster rate, which is measure. <coughs> And you can see, I mean, it doesn't seem like very hard math to you, right? But it's not. It's still, you know, you know, in phylogenetics, it's in nature. You can see how open the field is. <coughs> okay. So these are all modifications of the basic Brownian motion, right? I could try painting different rates, and we'll come back to this. There's also other processes that could be happening, too. Okay. So. <coughs> This is a different way of looking at the same model, basically. Okay, so we could have it really increasing or decreasing by chance, or we could have it changing directionally. Okay, so so far we've been having things, you know, I move right, where I move left doesn't depend on where I am. It's just, you know, now I can move right again or left again or whatever. Right? What if I'm being pulled with some value? What if I move too far from there, I get pulled back? Um, what process is that? And basically, what it is is this process just scaled a bit differently. So it's stretching this matrix in effect, and also changing the mean the mean vector a little bit. Okay. <coughs> so change instead of time, we can call this, and then delta x randomly. A Wiener process, Brownian motion, whatever. So a little normal, pull from normal. Here we have our friendly rate of wiggle again. Pull towards some value. We'll call theta. Okay. Um, how I know which which way we pull? Subtract our current value from that. All right. So if we're lower than theta, we go up. If we're bigger than theta, we go down. Very basic. Right now it's adding an entire difference in one step. But if we're only, what if we can't go there in one giant leap? Well, we can have a little strength of that, right? So as this gets smaller, you can go go. You know, it takes more steps to get there, right? So this is an ornstein uhlenbeck process. Okay, it's just a bit more complex than the regular Brownian motion we've been talking about. 
Okay? So basic model is like this, right? So you have your little particle wandering around, right? It has, a, has a elastic pull towards some point. So it moves around, right? <coughs> and gets pulled towards that point. Okay? But because it keeps wiggling, it has a wiggle, and so you know you give it chocolate, this increases, it can wiggle faster, right? Put more bands on, it gets pulled more. Okay? So think about evolutionary time, you know, I have something that, you know, is strong constrained to have one value. It can wiggle, even if it's wiggling really fast, it's still stuck near there. Right? So they have a less strong pull, it can wiggle further away. Okay? And so now I have another parameter to look at. And also I have this parameter, where, where, where's it being pulled to? So before we just had this and the mean, now we have this and basically a vector of mean to include this and also this pull parameter. Okay. <coughs> and back to your question about, you know, doesn't it change through time? Sure. So we could try painting, you know, we have these parameter values here, and then maybe these here, and these here, and so forth. Right? Um, <coughs> and we can imagine painting the trees in different ways. And so this is a very general model, okay? And this general model, initially, so this is a slight old slide, I should have updated this. Um, there was originally no way to do that. A paper just came out this year that can do that. Okay, I'll show you that later on. That can vary all of these, okay? Now, you don't want to do too much because you run out of power. Right? But again, you can go to the model selection and pick the best one. A single rate everywhere on the tree was used for a long time. So Felsenstein, 85, right? If Brandon talked to you about building trees using continuous data, I'm not sure if he did or not, did he? Trees, Brandon. Okay. Well, if he did, this is the model you use, okay? Also, we talked about the frog calls, right? How do you reconstruct those? Use the same model. Constant rate evolution, okay? Multiple means, so this is a slight you know, relaxation of this model. Now we have one rate everywhere, one attraction everywhere, but some variation in what they're being attracted to. Okay, this is a big innovation, 2004. Okay. My big claim to fame was you know, not having this, but now allowing this to vary. Okay. And now we finally gone and extended it to allowing everything to vary. Okay. We see I mean, these very basic models. And so all, all you do is, you know, you play a bit with here, and you also play with your mean vectors. Okay. And so if, you know, if I, if I remember that initial simulation at, at the beginning of class, got those things wobbling through time, what it's doing is trying to get back to the, to the optimal value, but it takes a while to get there. Okay. And that's it. <coughs> so we can, and so you use the same equation, basically, multivariate normal equation, but now what you do is you mess with this, say we're messing with the here, and you mess with this vector to get an single effect process. Okay? And one nice thing with this is now you can use it for ancestral state reconstruction too. Right? So I can say, okay, let's have this, this value here stuck in here. Okay? Let's try changing that value. How that affect likelihood? Right? And I can try different values and find the one that optimizes likelihood. So from Bayesian, I can do MCMC across a whole bunch of values. Okay. So now we can use the same approach, not only to test different rates, like here, but to actually estimate ancestral states. Just like we could with the discrete character models. Right? We can use them to estimate, try different rates, like the Pagel discrete stuff, or we can also use them to estimate ancestral states. Actually, you can do both at the same time. Any questions about this? So basically, a lot of work in the past, you know, f decade or so on continuous trait models is just playing with this. Okay. <coughs> and so, from this basic multivariate normal model, we can look at rates of evolution, different rates of evolution, what the attraction parameters are, associate reconstruction, and something more we're going to get to in a minute. Okay. All right. So we talked a lot about comparing models. Right? How do you compare models? So I mentioned AIC last time. Right. Good. 
Okay, why? So we'll get to this, but AIC is an estimator of the Kuhlbler, uh, kuhlbach liebler distance. What does that mean? <laughs> That's an estimate of the information you lose going from, a, from the truth to whatever model you're using. Okay. And with differences in AICs, well, 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 let me not, let me not, I'll get to the punchline in a sec. It's, good. it's, it's really cool. All right. So model selection. Maybe this gets cool with model selection. Yeah. Okay. Um, <coughs> so model selection. So what do we do with model selection? So here's the truth. Here are various models. Right? Why are we doing models in the first place? What's the point? Mm-hmm. Good. So why not just fit it perfectly? Mm -hmm. And we'll start fit, and we'll start fitting noise, too. And so actually, we'll, our predictions will get worse if we overfit, right? Whereas if we underfit, we'll also get a bad prediction. Okay, so you want to fit, you know, fit just the right amount. Okay. <coughs> and so basically, you fit a model in a better way of saying, okay, this model is better than this model. So do I have a model where I have these two rates being equal, or are they different? Which model fits the data better? So the classic way you do this is with a likelihood ratio test. Okay. I take my more complex model and my simpler model, take the difference in likelihood, right? You call it ratio because if you take the non-log likelihood, it's a division, right? The log becoming subtraction or addition again. Okay. <coughs> we take a test statistic and we run a statistical test, we do a chi-squared distribution and see is this significantly better or not. Okay. There's a few problems though. One requires nested models. Okay, what's what's a nested model? Yeah. It's not what it means in this case. Yeah, it's good. you're thinking of nested ANOVA, and that's wrong nesting. Yeah. So basically, it's models where one model is a simplification of another model. Okay. So here, the more complex model, my simpler model, has the mean. <coughs> this model is nested within here. So out of all, you know, out of all the possible parameter values for that, right? This model is just those that are on that quality line, right? Which model should which model should have that give the data better better likelihood? So, you know, with the, this more complex model, I can choose any parameter values here. With the simple model, I'm stuck on this line, right? And so, if the true value were right on this line, this model could get it. This model could too. If we're slightly off this line, this could still get it. This couldn't. So, like for this model, has to be, you know, as good as this or better. As good if it's exactly on the line. Better if it's a little off. So there's always going to be a better like this. Why don't, you, why don't you just use all, all the, the most complex model? <coughs> right. I'll start overfitting again. Yeah. And so, <coughs> like the ratio tests, I can compare and I can say, you know, which model works better, this model or the nest model within it? Is it turned up off or not? Okay. So is this nesting? And so for nucleotide models, we get this sort of comparison, right? 
So it can go this way. So you remember juice canter models? Okay. Tells us N81. Good Pelton's not popping up again. Um, I have to feel complete Pelton stuff. <laughs> um, yeah. um, so we have, you know, this model is slight, slight, you know, this actually has two rates. This is one rate. Okay, so they're nested. Here we're here, also nested. Here we have two rates. Here we have six rates nested. Okay. And that comparison. Here we have gamma elliptic varied, gamma fixed. So you can do this comparison this way. Okay. The problem with this is that I can't compare this model to this model directly. Okay, because they're not nested within each other. Okay. I can compare them to the same general model, but not with each other easily. And so for a lot of questions where things aren't nested, it becomes a problem. Um, <coughs> so for example, I could have compared this model to one where I have these equal, but now I have an alpha from an orthogonal vector greater than zero. Okay. This model, so this model here, this with alpha greater than zero, and this with alpha equal zero, they're both instructions of the same general model, but they're not nested within each other. So I can't compare them directly using likelihood ratio tests. So I think we have something else. Okay. So here's the Akaikian okay, information criterion comes in. To it. Okay. So AIC is an estimator between the, the distance between the truth and the approximating model. Okay. You don't know, this doesn't assume that the, that the true models in your set of models you're looking at. Just saying, you know, who's closer to New York, right? And it gives you an estimate of the distance between me and New York, okay? I'm trying to find out which of us is better, um, <coughs> at, you know, closer to New York. You know, the truth drops out as a constant. So me minus New York in terms of distance, you versus New York distance, the distance to New York actually drops out. All we have is the distance between me and him and that axis, right? So the truth drops out as a constant. Okay, and so <coughs> what you get is a ranking of models based on how far they are from the truth. You know, here's a case. Here's the study we did. So this is introducing that um, program that does the most general orange and black model. Okay, so we have this tree, and we have lots of herbaceous taxa and some woody taxa. Okay, green and brown. I want to say which model evolution works best. Okay. And <coughs> we get the likelihood of different models. Okay. And which model has the best likelihood? So it requires thinking backwards because you're like, okay, yes, yeah, so you have to like exponentiate, and then there's this minus thing hovering around, right? But in this case, this is the best model. Okay, here's the AIC values. Okay, and here they tend to correlate pretty well with likelihood. Okay, because AIC, it's complex in terms of what it's doing, right? But when you calculate it, it's super simple. Twice the log likelihood plus it should be actually twice the number of free parameters. Okay, so this model has three free parameters. <coughs> that one, that one, and that one. This model is free, free, uh, it has two free parameters. Oh, this is a free, this is zero. This has two free parameters too. This and that. Okay, so this counts the number of free parameters. Okay, there's a modification of ASC to deal with small sample size, which we can get to later. And so we get these scores, how far are we from New York? Okay. All we care about is relative distance. So take the minimum one, subtract the minimum from everything, get these numbers. Okay. And oftentimes it's all people show, just these numbers. So the one that's zero is the closest. Okay. That's the best model under AIC. Now, the thing you should ask is, well, this other, the second best model is this one, right? How much worse is it? Is it awful? Is it okay? And so one way to look to it is there's these rules of thumb that just developed. So if it's greater than two, it's pretty bad. If it's greater than ten, awful. Okay. If we have 26, pretty bad, right? Okay. 
Another way of doing it is to convert these into weights. Okay? So basically, how much of the overall model fit goes to each model. Okay? Those are a little easier to understand. Right? So 68% goes to this model, 29% goes to this model, or something goes to the other models. Okay? What you can do then is average, the model average. So do you know what a weighted average is? Yeah? Okay. So I could do a weighted average and say, okay, I have one rate from this model, one rate from this model. The overall best estimate for the rate is this value times its weight plus this value times its weight. So you can incorporate the uncertainty in the models when you're doing your, average, your parameter estimation. Okay? <coughs> one important thing to know about AIC, it's not hypothesis testing. Okay? It's saying which model is closer to the truth. It's not saying this model is significantly better than this model. But this model is rejected. Okay, saying this model is closer to the truth. Is this the truth? We don't know. Right? Versus other points would say, okay, this is significantly different from that one. Okay? Here's just ranking. Okay. And so a sure way to get, you know, a snippy reviewer to attack you is if you say, okay, this model is significantly better than this other model. <gasps> no, that's not the right way to do it with AIC. See, it'll be easy. You know, if I review your paper, I'll jump on you for that. Okay, so watch that. But if you're so used to thinking about these hypothesis testing thing, the sort of model weighting way of thinking is different. Okay. <coughs> Questions? Okay. Another way to compare models is using Bayes factors. Okay. And these are similar in flavor to AIC, okay, or likelihood ratio tests. Um, but basically you use the marginal likelihood, so the probability of the data given your model. Okay, which you calculate in this complex way. And there's ways to estimate it from an MCMC search that are often have issues in terms of getting the precise estimate correct. Okay, so these are these are possible in theory. Do not use much in phylogenetics. They're used in other areas though. Okay, um, where the 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 trick is calculating these numbers. Okay, calculate them correctly, and then compare the ratios. And again, here we have these rules of thumb. Right, two, ten, yeah. No, good question. Yeah, so. Uh, the Akeike information criterion, there are competitors like the BIC, the SIC, the Schwartz information criterion, the Bayes information criterion, that are slight tweaks of that. So rather than doing 2 likelihood plus 2K, it would be 2 likelihood plus, two K, plus 2K over N squared or something. So slight tweaks that, because AIC is an approximation to the KL distance, there might be better approximations or, more, or ones that are derived under different assumptions. Right, to get something that's so simple, you have to say, okay, and let's, let's here approximate this as 2. And say, well, let's approximate it as something else. And so there's slight tweaks there. Okay. But BAC isn't necessarily Bayesian. You can derive AAC under Bayesian principles or not, and same with BIC. There's different approaches. Some tend to choose more complex models than others. Okay. AAC is more standard, but people do use both. Good. Okay, base factors don't use it much. A new hot thing is reversible jump MCMC. Okay. <coughs> and here, so say maybe we're talking about you know putting on a hat and trying going from hat to hat, or looking at tree space going from tree to tree. Here we're going from model to model. Okay. So we're doing our little you know dance around, and we're changing parameters, but also sometimes we're actually switching the entire model. Okay. And then we go back and see how much time can be spent in each model. That gives us the estimate of the posterior probability of that model. And so that's an approach used by, <coughs> for example, the approach that's a way of looking at rates of evolution on the tree. And they just try, let's try putting one right here and see how good that model is. OK, let's try putting one right here and see how good that model is. And try, you know, so like, where do we paint these two rates? So we paint one right here and one right here. So I want to the whole tree. We sort of dance around model space, trying these different things, and getting the average okay. across all these models. Using this reversible jump thing. Okay? And with all MCMC approaches, you have to worry about good mixing. Right? So in the hat store example, if I have, if I you know, have you go in from the first hat at the, at the door, say, okay, take a picture and then stop. Well, you know, all I've seen is what hats what hats are close to the door, not what hats you like. I'm sure you can go look at the whole store, right? You don't get stuck looking at the baseball cap section or something. You can 
a look at the whole thing. The MCMC approach is you can get stuck if you construct the, the, the chain properly. Okay. So there's a real practical issue of, you know, there's a ways to test this, but it can be a practical issue. Okay. <coughs> so those are the main ways of comparing models. Um, AAC is probably most popular now. Rizzle jump MCMC is the hot new kid. Okay. Um, have likely ratio tests are still used though, so the classic approach. Okay. Let's skip this. Okay, correlation. Here I have a plot of leaf lifespan versus leaf size. So old leaves that live a long time tend to be small. Okay. What do you think about this this study? None of you are showing the appropriate reaction. You should be running screaming. Okay. Why? A lot of scatter, okay. That's one issue. That's not the big issue. This makes you go ham. Why should you run screaming? Okay, I said I mentioned IID again to you. Here's where it comes up. Yeah. So is it not identical? Like, should it be identical? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yep. Well, they're not independent. Okay. Yeah. Why not? Is it, is it the same tree? No, they're different species. Why do you have four limbs and bats have four limbs? Because it's awesome to have four limbs. Because it would be a live stream, or we wouldn't be totally out here for you, just like in a tropic system? Nope. Common ancestry, right? We didn't independently evolve four limbs, we inherited from a common ancestor, right? So we're going to look at the correlation between having hair and having four limbs, right? Why does that happen? Well, because our ancestor had four four limbs and hair, we just retain that trait. So yeah, we speciate, but it's not independent draws of four legs and four limbs, four, four, four legs and four in hair from you know independent examples. It's just you have this one thing you've overcounted because it's speciated. Right? Same thing here. Okay. So yeah these are different species, but they're all related. Okay? And so you can have this non-independence Due to them being related to each other. Okay, so I'll show you this in a second. So, here's this, this is a, one of the classic papers in phylogenetics you actually should read. Okay, so <coughs> here I have a very simple tree. Right, two clades. Okay, each with twenty species. And here are my set of points. So I evolved two traits: trait X and trait Y on the tree. Okay, are they correlated? Yeah, there's some scatter, but seem pretty correlated. But the issue is they're not independent. So it could be that all the open ones come from this clade, and all the buggy looking things come from this clade. That's all I've had, all I've done is had one evolution of figure X and one evolution of figure Y come from this branch, right? And they just have scatter around that. Right? So rather than having all these different points showing the same trend, all you really have is two clouds just offset by this one evolutionary event. Right? Because they're not independent. Okay. So are we out of luck? We want to do cross species comparisons? Let's go home. No. No in this case, but it should be something you should consider. There's a, there's a, there's a new trend in like phylogenetics where if you don't know the tree, you give it a best shot and then make up the rest. 
And you can say, is that really the best thing to do? Or maybe we just wait until we get the data. Right? So, I mean, there's an ancient paper published last week that made up most of the tree. And I mean, they had an algorithm for making it up. Is that okay or not? I mean, nature thinks so, but you know, it's nature. <coughs> That's something to think about. But here we don't have to make it up. We can deal with it directly. And we use a method called independent contrasts. Right? So yes, this whole clump of things might be correlated, right? But between here and here, they start with the same ancestor, and then one might change one trait, one might change the other trait. Right? But they're independent of everything else in the tree. That change. The change here and here, and here and here. They're independent of changes elsewhere in the tree. Okay? So rather than having you know, five comparisons here, I can get one, two, three, four independent ones. So there's one, one data point in order to get it so I have independent variables. It's pretty cool. Yeah? Can you that yep. Yep. Good. So I can contrast x1 and x2. Right? At this point, they're identical, same species. And they speciate. And so the change that's happening here is happening independently of the change that's happening over here. Right? And so what I do is look at this change here, that's one of my contrasts. This change here is another one of my contrasts. Does it matter that they were the same at zero or had a combination of No, because I'm looking at the deviation rather than how, how far from there from here, just how far they are from and actually just to compare these two. So if it were um, I could have brain size and body size. Right? So yes, there's some common one here. What I can do is compare, you know, two minus one versus fifteen minus ten. Minus one, one, fifteen minus ten. Five, right? So if I go this way, I've gone up brain, body. Okay. I've gone up one for brain and five for body. At that point. Okay. To this point. Okay, I go from uh, five to seven, okay, to minus two. In 12, 13 plus 1. That's this point. Okay, it's independent of everything else. Okay? And then the only trick is you can also do it between this and this, right? By reconstructing what this could be. Okay? And that's what, so here's 6. So x6 is this. Okay? And basically it's the average. Of these two, okay, weighted by the branch length. Okay, so if I have something like this, right? Well, this value is probably closer to this one than to this one. Right, so I weight the average that way. Okay, that's basically it. There's a little tweak to deal with the fact that we're at, like when we're doing this one, it's actually reconstructed rather than observed, so there's a little bit more error variance. There's some extra terms you'll see in here that I can deal with that. That's the basic idea of independent contrasts. So you go from you know n data points to n minus one contrasts. Okay. And this assumes the same Brownian rate model that we we're talking about earlier. Okay. When you're doing this reconstruction, this is implicitly assuming that same model. Okay. If that should be a different model, you can just change it. Change the change the branch length. Okay. And there's ways to do that. And so here's that same plot I showed earlier. This time I've, I've colored them differently. Now I have angiosperms and conifers colored differently. Right? And where I see it, I see a big clump here, 
conifers have old small leaves, needles. Ninja sperms had big short leaves, maples. Right? And the only contrast that leads to this sort of pattern is ninja sperms versus conifers, which will appear in a sec. Okay, so I combine that with the tree. And do my infinite contrasts. Okay. So, you know, these comparisons and get this instead. This entire pattern of this negative slope comes from this one comparison between angels from the conifers. Okay? So if I if I ignore the tree, I get this nice, you know, great regression and get the wrong answer because I'm overcounting each of them. So this is why any time, and, and, this isn't, and this isn't necessarily an evolutionary question. This could be an ecological question, right? How does leaf lifespan affect, you know, relate to uh, leaf size? Something evolutionary about that, about like ecological factors, right? But even so, because species are, in, are not independent, to correct for that. I think we're dealing with more than two species. You have to correct for that independence, at least test for it. Okay? <coughs> um, which is why you should have run screaming when you first saw this. Because they're treating all these pieces as independent when actually we know they're not. Okay? And there are, so we can do contrast, there's also ways to test how independent are they. Okay? If the true tree were this, this nice bush, right, then we're okay. Right? They actually are independent, they all from here separately. But if it's not, right, this one's going to be more similar to this one than it is to this one because of the shared ancestry. Right, so you, have to, you have to take that into account when you're doing your models. Okay. And so some of the models we to deal with that are the ones we talked about today, the burning motion ones, the the character correlate, the um, uh, model we talked about last time could also be used for this, right? So we're talking about the, that model that had you know, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, that matrix, right? One way of doing correlation is to say, you know, okay, let me count how many I have in each state, right? So that ignores the fact that I could have lots more diversification in one state, right? But if you do this, you know, the rate model, you can set that directly. So even if you're just, just doing straight-up ecology, don't care about evolution at all for some reason, you still need to control for the non-independence of species. Okay? <coughs> Make sense? It's like you want to look at study of like, why does you know speaking English in your country correlate with red, white, and blue in your flag? Right? It happens in New Zealand, it happens in Great Britain, it happens in the US. Well, there's a correlation there because of the shared history. Right? It's not just that English speakers like those colors. It's like to work red, <laughs> right? There's a correlation, you have to deal with that. So, same thing with species. Any questions? So I had an exercise we could do, but we're running short on time. Um, <coughs> basically, what you could do, you can do this at home if you want. Um, use this LA package and try comparing a couple of models. So you could do one model that has a single Brownian rate and one model that has two Brownian rates. Right? Like sigma purple versus sigma blue, or sigma purple equals sigma blue. And just see, how would you compare these models? Okay, you can do that at home. All right, questions about this? This is a lot. So what are the main points from today? Bring you in markers. What else? Essential learning theory applies to trees and species. Mm -hmm. 
I mean, not theory, actually theorem, which is even stronger than theory. Because it's math. Multivariate normal distribution, Brownian motion, relate to trees. Right? It gives us this very simple way of looking at this co co variance covariance matrix and this mean vector vector. Right. And the last part. Comparing models. Comparing models. Yep. Okay, the part after that part. Ways to compare models is good, so no? Yep, exactly. The fact that you, that should be your sort of your, your gut instinct. It's like you see it, like you know, part of part of your training is like learning instincts, right? And so like, you see it, see this raw comparison doesn't deal with that. It's like something's not right. It's like you're learning to talk. talk someone, here's someone talking about basal taxa. Happens. It happens, it happens, but so it's true. And the example with the leaves, uh -huh. and I think like that, it's something more like you can tell for the common ancestor, but they have to know the tree, yep. so they have to go back and look for it. Yep. Which makes people want to avoid having, I mean, sometimes getting trees can be hard, right? Mm -hmm. And so I'd be like, oh, well, I could get a tree, or I could just sort of punt, and assume that, the, you know, that they're dependent. Um, which people do want to do. But I mean, nowadays, I mean, you can go, 10% like, of all life is in GenBank, right? So you can go to a sequence, you know, one of 10 chance you can get a sequence for some part. If it's actually something you're looking at, there's a good chance it'll be there, right? So it's something that people, it's, it's close, it's, you know, feasible for you to study, then it's feasible for other people to study too. So it's a good chance it'll be in GenBank. Um, and for, like, for example, for mammals, there is a tree that has all but two mammal species in it. It's not a great tree. It has all these polytomies in it, like rodents are in this big bush. Like, and then there were rodents of some sort. We don't know which one's really. You know. So it has some issues. Um, but you can still pretty much have a tree for all mammals. The bird tree that was in nature last week, right, partially made up. right. So they actually have a cloud of possible trees. But I mean, it's not as bad as you know, making it sound. I mean, so like, if, for example, if I know that these birds are in one genus, okay, that's probably a clade. So I might not know where they go in that clade, but they're probably somewhere in there. So I only have like one member of that genus in my in my you know in, in my data set of the Smokies, then the rest of that sorry doesn't really matter, right? So I can but, you know, also you can say okay, there's this uncertainty, we get the same result no matter what the tree is, okay? Yeah. So there's something to think about. But yeah, I mean trees are getting this is now an open tree of life project, where its main goal is to um, produce a tree of everything this year. It'll be a terrible tree, right? But for you know, if you want, if you have you know one angiosperm and one and one pine and you know a squirrel, you know you can get a subtree from that. It's probably going to be okay. So. Or you can use your skills you learned last time, you know, the last 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 section with Brandon and build your own tree. Right? Or talk to you know one or every two faculty here that builds trees. So just ask them at random. Good. All right. Don't forget to let me know. Don't forget to give me feedback. So, if something you want different or something you're not sure about, just let me know. All right. Thank you.